When I started this project last spring, he had not yet been translated into English, but then this past June, his scolia to an implicit text was published in English. But I did not dismay. Determined, I bought the book and discovered that despite it not saying so on the book, it is only a collected version, containing only about 22% of his entire body of aphorisms. In making it a collected version, damage was done to the original text, as the text's aphorisms reference each other and progress in their own special order. Um, an example of them referencing each other is this bit between uh, aphorism 52 and 54. The bourgeois turn over power in order to save money. Then, they hand over money in order to save their skin. And finally, they are hanged. Next aphorism. Bourgeoisie is any group of individuals who are displeased with what they have and satisfied with what they are. Next aphorism. Marxists define the bourgeoisie economically in order to hide from us that they belong to her. Uh, the epithets in the book and uh, some of the meta-discursive aphorisms weren't translated either. Um, and these specifically color and set the tone of the text, so they're important. Um, for instance, epithet number six by Nietzsche says, what is involved here is the extensive logic of a very developed philosophical sensibility and not the jumble of a hundred random paradoxes and heterox heterodoxies. This, I believe, even my most sympathetic readers have not realized. And epithet seven by Petrarch. And you wonder why few find me agreeable. I agree with few. Almost all things seem otherwise to me than to the crowd, and I always consider the right path to be the farthest from the crowd. Uh, plus, this translation into English isn't that great. Uh, it seems that it was done by someone whose mother tongue wasn't English. And uh, nonetheless, I, refer I reference it to help me in my own translation. Um, so overall, the Escolios constitutes a significant contribution to literature, philosophy, modern thought and discourse, the form and style of the aphorism, and the reactionary genre of literature. Working on this project has been a great joy, it's right up my alley, and I plan to publish my own translation of the entire series. Hopefully it will be the first full translation in English, and hopefully people will find it good. If it's not the first full translation, I am nevertheless confident that it will be a good, valuable translation and contribution. Uh, this translating undertaking has helped my Spanish, thought, writing, work ethic, confidence, and ambition. I've also gained valuable knowledge about publishing, promotion, and discourse in the process. Um, and now for the art of translating in my method. Um, first of all, comfort and focus is essential. Uh, so I have, a, I have a desk in an ergonomic desk chair, and I have one of these things, a little book stand, and um, I put the book in it, and then I, I have my arms around the book, like I'm hugging it, and, uh, and then I type. So I can just, I can read and type very quickly that way. Uh, and I have two stacks of books on either side of me. Uh, I have an English thesaurus, uh, a Spanish-English dictionary. I have uh, an important set of books, um, the uh, Diccionario Española uh, de la Academia Real, um, the, the um, Spanish Dictionary of the Royal Academy, which is their national uh, academy's Spanish dictionaries, and it catalogs words and definitions um, throughout all of the Spanish-speaking world, which is important because Davila's a Colombian writer, so sometimes he'll use a Spanish word that means something, <clears throat> that has a special meaning uh, in its Colombian usage. Um, and, and I also use SpanishDictionary.com. Um, so, when, when I go through, I try, to, I try to find and keep in mind the meaning of every word because, because there are so many different connotations and secondary meanings and images that are evoked 
um, by each word. Um, and if, if I can't translate uh, an aphorism, I, I put a little asterisk next to it so that I can control F, find, search um, for that aphorism later, and then I send that aphorism to my uh, faculty mentor who helps me translate it. Um, so to produce a good translation format, great care and great attention are important. Uh, I've made some specific formatting decisions. I, if you notice, I put the numbers of the aphorisms at the top uh, of each page. And I put them at the top instead of right next to where the aphorism begins because that would be kind of unsightly if I did that. Um, and it would ruin the simple elegance of the, of the, of the format and the presentation. Um, this numbering of aphorisms hasn't been done yet, and it will make it possible to index the aphorisms by subject matter and to cite them. Uh, I've also retained the page numbering of the original Spanish version so that there's reciprocity between page citations. Um, I include no introduction or blurb or commentary in order to retain the book's focus and original intent, that is, as a commentary of an implicit text. I retained and translated the epithets. Um, <clears throat> I found it amazing that the scolia to an implicit text did not retain the epithets. There are, the first two epithets are in Spanish, um, and then there's a set of five epithets in English, German, Greek, Latin, and um, French. Um, so the major bodies of world literature there. And uh, it's probably like he's showing off a little bit because he could read all those languages and read a lot in those literary traditions. Um, so a traditional expression of translating is that the translation should fully represent the ideas and the style of the original and should possess the ease of the original, trans, uh, the original composition. Today, these principles are summarized as fidelity, clarity, and elegance. And I try my best to stay true to these, and I think effect also has a place in here as well. There are seven types of translating, and they exist in a spectrum that goes from painstakingly and even awkwardly exact to casually, excessively, and impressionistically idiomatic. I fall in the middle of this spectrum, but usually tend towards the more literal side. I try to translate the aphorisms as accurately as possible, trying to maintain the literal and connotative meanings, underlying connections, and evoked images, while making sure that the words, syntax, and sentence sound good and not awkward. Um, and I have some examples of how it can be difficult to maintain these underlying connotative literary meanings and images. Um, aphorism 377 is, Despair is the gloomy gorge through which the soul ascends toward a universe no longer clouded by greed. And in the word gloomy, the word gorge, uh, the word uh, ascends, and uh, the word clouded are all, they're all very hard to translate. They all connect with each other. You know, you see this image of a gloomy gorge and the soul ascending up and um, going through the clouds. That is the image he was trying to write in here. Um, but a more literal translation of this would be despair is the shadowy canyon through which the soul ascends toward a universe that is not blotted or tainted with greed. And so if you take that literal translation, you lose the entire image he was trying to, uh, trying to evoke. Um, sometimes these difficulties are very difficult to overcome. Um, and sometimes they're just impossible because words in other languages can have different connotations, secondary meanings, and etymological roots that they don't have in the target language. 
For example, the Spanish word rechazo is our word for pulp or husk. Um, but rechaz rechazar means to reject in Spanish. So we don't think of pulp as being the rejected part of the fruit. But um, that's the Spanish do because it's right in their word. And, and Davila wrote an aphorism where I had to overcome that. And uh, another example is Spanish uses the word aficionado, and we've basically just adopted the word because fan, fan seems to evoke images of like sports, sports fans, and not really like a mature intellectual fan of of something. Um, so sometimes our language has a word for something that theirs doesn't, and vice versa. In conclusion, this multifaceted under undertaking has been very enriching and encouraging to me, and it is important and relevant in many ways. I plan to continue enjoying this work by translating the whole series and publishing it, establishing me as an author. Thank you.